The reading today is from uh, Romans 15. It's verses 17 to, through 33. And it's on page 950 in your pew Bible. In Christ Jesus, then, I have reason to be proud of my work for God. For I will not venture to speak of anything except what Christ has accomplished through me to bring the Gentiles to obedience. By the word and deed, by the power of signs and wonders, by the power of the Spirit of God, so that from Jerusalem and all the way around to Illyricum, I have fulfilled the ministry of the gospel of Christ. And thus I make it my ambition to preach the gospel, not where Christ has already been named, lest I build on someone else's foundation. But as it is written, those who have never been told of him will see, and those who have never heard will understand. This is the reason why I have so often been hindered from coming to you. But now, since I no longer have any room for work in these regions, and since I have longed for many years to come to you, I hope to see you in the passing as I go to Spain, and to be helped on my journey there by you, once I have enjoyed your company for a while. At present, however, I'm going to Jerusalem, bringing aid to the saints, for Macedonia and, Macedonia and Archaea have been pleased to make some contribution for the poor among the saints at Jerusalem. For they were pleased to do it, and indeed they owe it to them. For if the Gentiles have come to share in their spiritual blessings, they ought also to be of service to them in material blessings. When therefore I have completed this and have delivered to them what has been collected, I will leave for Spain by way of you. I know that when I come to you, I will come to you in the fullness of the blessing of Christ. I appeal to you, brothers, by our Lord Jesus Christ and by the love of the Spirit, to strive together with me in prayers to God on my behalf, that I may be delivered from the unbelievers in Judea, and that my service for Jerusalem may be acceptable to the saints, so that by God's will I may come to you with joy and be refreshed in your company. May the God of peace be with you all. Amen. Good to be with you again. We were at a family event up in Wisconsin last week, but I had opportunity to hear Pastor Jason's uh, message and was blessed by it. I also want to thank each and every one of you. There's different individuals that are involved in different aspects of ministry, and this week I was blessed to just watch what was going on, first of all, on Wednesday with the Awana Fair and the work of our young people and the sponsors and the Awana workers that were a part of uh, putting that together, thanks to Mary and to Tom and my wife who put the uh, stuff up and, and uh, we're just excited to see their faces as they are watching the young people excited. And, and, uh, but to see our youth and the Awana workers work so hard to make it such a great event um, and to see parents that sometimes will not come to church but now had opportunity to do so, it just is a blessing and uh, God uses it. But then on Thursday night, we were able to go to the um, Pregnancy Options Center banquet and see what's going on there and also see um, different individuals that are part of our church family that are involved in the counseling ministry or the volunteering or on the board and, and things along that line. It's just it's such an encouragement to see the service and the willingness to step out and be used of God. And so I want to just kind of do this again. That's my way of trying to get your attention on something here, that um, each of you, if you are a son or daughter of God by the fact that you've received Jesus Christ as your Lord and Savior, you've been given gifts. And we had a series on that back in January talking about biblically what that looks like. 
and you have opportunity to serve in the church. Some of you have opportunities to serve in other places and, and things along that line, but I want you to um, take advantage of the fact that as Don was mentioning during the song uh, leading today, that we are entrusted with something, but we're also blessed by the fact that God wants to use us. And so let me just ask you again. I'm kind of putting this out to you. And that isn't just coming and receiving right now. I'm glad you're here, but he's got so much more for you that he wants to use you in. And if I were to go around the room and you're like, I don't know where I'm gifted, I could tell you. I see just watching the times that I've been with you, see that and to say, would you be willing to use for eternal matters your giftedness for the glory of God. Would you be willing to do that? That's exciting. And as we're, we just got done, Mark led us in that scripture, it talks about things like that. So this is my way of saying to you, would you be willing to do that and see what God does? And you know, I don't know how he could use me. Well, talk to myself or somebody else, and I guarantee you, uh, you would see that. And it would be how you're wired. It wouldn't be, we're going to ask you to do something that isn't you. Now, that happens sometimes. I had opportunity just a few weeks ago to ask a friend, a, a part of our church family here, if he, if he would read Scripture. And he goes, boy, you're really pushing me here. You're taking me out of my comfort zone. And then I gave him like 12 verses. I said, but he said yes. And then I gave him like 12 verses, and then he texts me back, where did the three-verse sermons go? <laughs> but his willingness to do that. And sometimes, by the way, some of you um, getting up and reading, I'll tell you, you can read, and then you get up here and your eyes start to dance. It's amazing what starts to happen. And so I understand that sometimes that isn't the case. But that's just one thing that really blessed my heart as someone that he didn't think that, I don't know, and he did great. He did fantastic. And so it's one of those things that I just want to encourage you. Would you be willing to step out in that way or even ask the Lord about that? Because as we're looking at this passage of Scripture today, the second to last verse that Mark read to us tonight, today, I want you to take a look at that. It's verse 32. He says, so that by God's will I come. I may come to you with joy and, and be refreshed in your coming. And so this is me again saying to you, one of, the, one of the basic things of being a Christian is to desire God's will. I mean, I've, I remember growing up and I would go to these youth rallies and, and they would talk a lot about God's will. And it seemed to be this mysterious thing that was floating out there that how do I ever know what God's will is? Well, let's pray and then let's get into this passage today and see what the Lord uh, does to, to teach us. Let's pray. Father, thank you for your will. Thank you for your faithfulness to it. Thank you that if we were to ask or we are to talk about this, and I was to ask, I think each and every person here, would you want to do what God's will is for your life? Would you want to do what God would want for your life? I don't think I would get, nah, I'd rather go with plan B. Because you're really wise, God. You're really smart. And so I'm asking you, Father, to, as we're getting insight a little bit into the heart of Paul, that we would inculcate by your Spirit these items, these, these principles, so that would help us in our walk. And that we would not, yeah, that's, that was him, or that's, that's, that's those other people. But it's a, every person that calls on the name of the Lord. Eternity is a lot longer than this life, and, and so you're, you're calling on us to think eternally. We hear the Lord's Prayer, sometimes by football players before a game, that they want the will of God in heaven, on earth as it is in heaven. 
And so, God, I ask you that we would be that heavenly-minded, that we would think that way. So, God, would you help us with that today? Would you break, break aside the barriers that would be there, that people would put up, that we would put up? And we naturally, we like what we want. And I'd ask you that we delight ourselves also in you, and then you'll give us the desires of our heart. Thank you, Lord. In Jesus' name, amen. Well, as we come to this passage of Scripture, we've got a, a few verses here uh, to, to look at today. And as that second last verse that we looked at talks about God's will, there's this, there's this thing that's, that's out there called God's will. And, and to Paul, it was a very important thing. Uh, Paul and David were a lot alike uh, in that area. They wanted to do God's will. Are you ever like that? Do you ever think like that? Like, what would God want me to do in these different situations? Like last week, I'm up in Wisconsin. And you might go, well, but it's because you're a pastor. No, I'm, t- I'm telling you, I'm not that great. I know you're like, we know. All right. And thank you. By the way, Pastor Jason and I are humbled by the sign outside and by the, 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 the way of you showing love to us. Um, in prayer meeting, when I'm sitting there and people pray for me, it doesn't make me think, yeah, you know what, I'm pretty worthy of that. Here's what goes through my mind. I'm floored. I'm blessed. I'm humbled by it. I'm not worthy of it. But last weekend when I was up in Wisconsin, and I have opportunity to be with different people, I don't think to myself, well, I'm on vacation, so I don't have to think about them anymore. I do, a pa- I do the pastor gig in Warrington. But when I'm away from here, they don't know. I could hide it really well. I can't do that. I'm not allowed to. Vacation doesn't allow that to happen. And so... It's still part of the DNA, and I think it's yours too. I think it's your calling too, that when opportunities come up to serve, opportunities to to do things, that you don't go, I'm I'm on vacation. It's I'm willing to, okay, I'll do that too. Whatever that is, however that's, and, and we talk about this will of God. David said this in Psalm 40, verse 8. He says, I delight to do your will, oh my God. Yay, your law is within my heart. David does that in Psalm 40 in verse 8, and, and there's a messianic sentiment repeated in Hebrews 10, verses 5 through 7. We see Paul saying this, listen to this, in the opening of 1 Corinthians and, and 2 Corinthians and Galatians and Ephesians and Colossians and 2 Timothy, he introduces himself as an apostle by the will of God. So you, whatever the calling on your life is, you could put that calling and say, by the will of God. And if you aren't that, then, then what, what is the guiding principle? By the will of Mark? Oh, that's scary. By the will of, and you could fill in whatever that thing is, and if it's not God... For the Christian, that's a scary way to live. It's, it's very temporary. And so that has bearing on how I do life, who I do life with. I mean, he's got loads of verses on how I treat my wife, how I treat my kids, who I date, who I marry, what I do with my time. Those are important things. It says in 2 Corinthians 8, 5, that these things were given by the will of God. Uh, Paul called Christians to understand that in Ephesians 5, 17, what the will of the Lord is. He said, be not wise, unwise, but understanding what the will of the Lord is. In Ephesians 6, 6, he calls on us to do the will of God from our heart. He prayed for his own disciples in Colossians 1 9 to be filled with the knowledge of the Lord's will. I mean, this is a pattern that keeps repeating over and over in the scriptures. And it doesn't say if you're an apostle or if you're a pastor, 
It's for all of us that call ourselves believers. And then it isn't relegated to just Paul and, and Jesus and David. James, James 4, 15, he says to us, you ought to say, if the Lord wills, we will live and do this or that. In fact, and what it's saying is it's presumptuous to do anything else. Then Peter says, so is the will of God that with well-doing you may put to silence the ignorance of foolish men. This is the calling. And and then John says in in 1 John 2.17, he that does the will of God abides forever. Do you see it as a pattern in Scripture? And this book that we've been given is for us. It's God's calling on us. And it's exciting to live like that. So, so I walk into a restaurant. I walk, how is God going to use me today? I had a guy just the other day, I'm walking into church here. And by the way, I want to give these things to God. I'm telling you. But I was talking to him. His name's Mark. It wasn't hard to remember. As I walk in, I said, what brings you to, to grace here? He goes, you did. And I go, I did. He goes, yeah, like a couple years in a Chinese restaurant. You said I like your haircut because he's bald. <laughs> I don't remember saying that to him. But I pray every day that God would somehow use me. I want to be, as, as I step into these different situations, and by the way, it doesn't happen I feel like I let him down constantly by my selfishness, by I want Mark's will more than his. But you look at the pattern in Scripture. It's such a beautiful thing. Even our Lord, remember when he was in his garden? Remember when he was in the garden? He's sweating drops of blood because he knows what's coming his way. And he goes, well, nevertheless, not my will, but yours be done. It's a, it's a really great pattern. It's an exciting way to pray. It kind of takes things out of our control. And I like the remote in my hand. I just do. Not just in the living room, in life. Well, this will of God thing, it's, there's three different aspects that I see that are listed in Scripture. First of all, we have that sovereign will of God. And what is meant by that is that there's this absolute, unalterable, inviolable will of God that never changes. The sovereign will of God relates to God's control of history, to his absolute outworking purpose in history. It's unwavering. It's perfectly carried out to the fulfillment without variation. It's the, it's the thing that he raises up kings and puts them down. I could go on with different verses that teach that. He's in control. But in the midst of that, there's other aspects of the will of God. There's the moral will of God. And that moral will has to do with God's desire for obedience to his express standard of righteousness. That moral will of God is is bound up in every command in the Bible. It's the calling of God on all of our lives. He's got verses in there about, and he'll say, and this is the will of God. Like one in particular, this is, and this hits our culture hard. This is the will of God that you avoid sexual immorality. It's, it, we don't have to go, I wonder if he wants me to live with that girl that I'm not married to. I wonder. You don't have to pray that. You don't have to wonder that. It's his will that you don't do that or get married. And today, I live in a day, you live in a day, where that is even sidestepped by Christians. They'll rationalize that one away. And I'm saying to you, you want to be in God's will, that's that's a biggie. Oh, that sounds so old-fashioned. It's as old-fashioned as the Bible. So we have the sovereign will, we have the moral will, and that a third dimension, 
And that's the one that we're looking at today as we look in the word here, is uh, God's personal will. It's a, it's a will for an individual believer's life. And I, and I want you to understand that so much of what is tied to that is tied to the word of God, which is the moral, and his plan. And so you might be sitting there, oh, I don't, I don't want to miss it. I don't want to miss it. And you could get overwhelmed by that. Would you just, here's a, here's a, I know this is going to sound really radical. Obey the Bible. And you're going to do a lot of the will of God. If we would obey just with what we know. And then there are going to be times where circumstances arise and how you handle it says, am I willing to be obedient to the Lord in this thing? Would you be willing to do that and be excited about what he would do? Because if you delight yourself also in the Lord, he will give you the desires of your heart. You'll be floored. Well, point number one as we're working through this together is the credit for accomplishing church growth. I, I love the fact that our church numerically is growing. But my heart's cry, my heart's desire is for us each to be growing. Not growing, but growing. The depth of our walk with the Lord. That our, our hearts would be attuned to him. And so as we look at this together, I want you to take a look at this first verse because it hits on kind of something that was mentioned in the song time together, the worship time together in music. Look at verse 17 with me. In Christ Jesus, then, I have reason to be proud of my work for God. Now, you ever think about that as a, as a believer, that there's times where you believe, I think God's using me, I think he is. I don't know for sure, but I think he is. And you, it, but I don't want to be proud about it. I want to be proud. Because then I'm going to blow the whole thing here. But, it, but he uses the word. He uses the word. He says, I have reason to be proud of my work for God. This, this verse could be rendered, so then I have confidence in Christ Jesus regarding the things about God that I have been asserting. You see, proud of my work may come across as proudful, as even sinful, as, as even anti-biblical. But this is a pride in what Christ has accomplished so that he gets the glory. So when somebody comes up to you sometime and they would say to you, thank you so much for how God's used you in my life, Biblically, you don't have to go, oh, it was nothing. I don't, God, you did notice I'm not you know. you can You can say, well, thank you. Oh, you're welcome. And, and God is good. And sometimes, and isn't it funny, I don't know if over the years you've done ministry, you've done things, and there's a bunch of you here that do that the things that people are blessed by, you thought it was this other thing, and they come up and you, you did this. And, and I think that's, that's the catch. I think that's God going, I just want you to know, I'll use you when I want to use you. And I'll do it how I want to do it. But would you be willing to, to allow me to do that? What better way to And so, biblically, we can receive that and, and be, thank you, Lord. I, I don't know, there's been so many times I've walked away from some different things going, well, thank you. When I said that to that guy in that restaurant, and he, I didn't, I'm, he'll come to church. I'll mention his haircut. I, I was thinking about the egg rolls. I wasn't thinking. But I prayed at the beginning of the day. I'm saying to you, Give your day to God. See what he does. And I'm praying that the first day, it goes well for you. Because I know that there's going to be times where you pray, and then it, 
you get into a car accident or you something happened, you have a flat tire or something. Oh, thanks a lot, Pastor. It's the last time I do that. But it's a calling for each of us. Look at this, Matthew 28, 19. Go therefore, and this is the calling for all of us as Christians, go therefore and make disciples of all nations, baptizing them in the name of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Spirit. I'm supposed to share this thing. I'm supposed to. 1 Peter 3.15. But in your hearts, honor Christ the Lord as holy, always, always, not when I'm on vacation, no, always being prepared to make a defense to anyone who asks you for a reason for the hope that is in you, Yet do it with gentleness and respect. Colossians 4, 5. Walk in wisdom toward outsiders, making the best use of the time. So this, is, this is from the Word. This is for all of us. I, I'm, I'm asking you to be eternally conscious that I want to use you everywhere. And then when I do, be blessed. God used me. Oh, God used me. Thank you, Lord. And how you're wired. Let's keep going. Secondly, the agents for accomplishing this church growth. Look at verse 18. For I will not venture to speak of anything except what Christ has accomplished through me to bring the Gentiles to obedience by word and deed. He's, he's bold, but he's not going to venture to call attention to his own achievement. Look what I've done. That's why it always, some of you have worked in ministries where you got to fill out how many people made decisions. And in your heart, you're going, it's hard. It's a hard thing to fill out. Because first of all, how do we know? How do we know? Whenever, so, hey, God, 42 people got saved at this thing. I say 42 people made a profession of faith. I don't know. I don't know. God knows. But even if you start getting caught in those numbers, it's just a hesitancy on your part. And that's what I like about Paul. He's saying, I did this thing. I'm throwing out this seed. I'm trusting God. And that's all that we're called to do. Just throw it out and see what he does. It's exciting. And so he's bold about this. And, and he understands that it's in word and deed. It's what is said and what is done. And he's calling us to do it. And it's exciting to see that. God, you want to use me? And he'll use you in ways that will floor you with how you're wired. And so you take your hobby. You take the thing that you love and you go, God, I want, I want to use this for you. Like something that really blessed me at the Thursday night thing. We're there and they, there was a comedian at this event. And well, I, I was, I'm in, all right? But he knew pop culture like crazy. And it's almost like, I think I lived, this was, he li I lived this guy's life. All the TV shows he knew, all the different things that movies and, and songs and, and things out there. And he was able to weave it in a way that when he presented it to us, God got glory out of it. I eat that up because that's me. I love that stuff. But some of you, that's not, you have no interest in this. But you love hunting. You love fishing. You like pool. I could keep going on. The different things. And you, would you be willing to say with whatever that hobby is, God, after, let's say you live 90 years, then you die. Whatever time I have left, I'm not just doing this thing for my personal entertainment but I'm going to take it and I'm offering it to you and I want you to take it and use it. And I could go around the room with each of you, the things I see. Some of you are runners. Some of you are singers. I could, I could keep going as I get to know you. Would you be willing to say, I'm giving that thing to God and what he does, and that's word and deed. But he doesn't just stay there. He goes on to verse 19. 
by the power of signs and wonders, so the, those miraculous things that were during that ap apostolic age with the giftedness of Paul. And then he says, by the power of the Spirit of God. Now here's what I love about that. He understands, like Spurgeon, Charles Spurgeon would say this, alluding back to the Elijah story. Remember the Elijah story? Where he's building that altar on Mount Carmel, and he's taking all those rocks, he's taking the time to build it all up, and, he's doing, and then he pours water on it because the prophets of Baal, they're cutting themselves and stuff, and nothing's happening. He does all that work, presents the sacrifice, and then what does he have to do? He has to call out to God for fire to fall. It, it's, this is out of his hands. I can build the altar. I can do all of these things. But he's got to cry out to God because without it, it's life. With, it's no life. It's kind of like that scene. This is going to sound really spiritual. It's that scene from Young Frankenstein where Gene Wilder, is trying to bring life to the monster. And he's screaming like nobody can scream. Nobody can scream like Gene Wilder. Life! Life! Asking Marty Feldman, Igor, to flip the levers, all right? Because he knows that without this power coming, I know you're going, are you preaching Bible or Mel Brooks here? I'm trying to get your attention with this weekend coming up here, okay? All that's going on. That without life coming from God, we're dealing with dead men. Scraps of individuals put together without the power of God put in them. And so let's keep building the altars. Let's keep doing what we need to do, creating environments, having the Awana affairs, putting together a pregnancy option center. I could keep listing the different things, opportunities. But without God, that's why prayer is so important. Without calling out to God, the Spirit of God, because remember we said this, Jesus said this word, without me, you can do nothing. It's dead without him. So that from Jerusalem, finishing on verse 19, so that from Jerusalem and all the way around to Illyricum, I have fulfilled the ministry of the gospel of Christ. He understands I've done it. I've done this because of what God has done and my willingness to give him my life my willingness to hand it over to him, because that's what he said in Romans 12, 1 and 2. Don't be conformed to this world, but be transformed by the renewing of our mind, giving our bodies, asking God to use me. That's the perfect will of God. Point number three, the method for accomplishing church growth. Look at verse 20. And thus... I make it my ambition. This is Paul saying to you and me, and he's calling on all of us to do I make it my ambition to preach the gospel. Not where Christ has already been named, lest I build on someone else's foundation. And I want you to look at that and go, I hope you don't look at that and go, so I've got I, I to I've got to do something brand new. That could be the case, but you may be called to build on somebody else's. It's, you're not wired the way to, to pioneer like Paul did, but he's saying, this is how God made me. And then Paul quotes Isaiah, but as is written, those who have never been told of him will see, and those who have never heard will understand. He's quoting Isaiah 52, 15. He's quoting that verse there. And so he's... It would make sense that we understand Paul's claim in those verses as preparation for his appeal to them. He's going he's to come to them and, and ask for something, and he's laying a foundation of something. He's always thinking. And when we, what, what happens with us, and I don't know if you're like this, I think you are, with how you're wired, you can't turn some of this off. Whatever that thing is, you can't turn it off. And I'm asking you to add a dimension to it where God's involved with that. And see what he does. See how he uses you. 
It's a great way to live. And that's the calling for Paul. But we've got to follow our calling. And how I find that out is taking perspective of my spiritual gifts, having good conversations with godly people that could give me some wisdom in that area, and then being willing to step out and see what he does. The the verse here, uh, the results of point number four, the results of accomplishing this church growth. Look at verse 22 and 23. This is the reason why I I have so often been hindered from coming to you. So he's wanted to go to Rome. Isn't this interesting? We're We're getting a bird's eye view here, an insight into the heart of Paul and tied to the Lord's sovereign will of his life. He wants to go see them, but he's been hindered. You ever been stopped in something that you want to do? Some of you are like, yes, and I don't like it. I get upset when there's somebody like in Walmart with their cart in my way. Some of you are like, I never, you're that person? <laughs> Let's keep moving. But he's, he's, he's resting in the Lord's will enough that he goes, I've been hindered. But now, verse 23, since I no longer have any room for work in these regions, so I've, I've been fulfilling the wor- work of God in my life here, and I've planted the seeds or I've had other people do that work, and since I have longed for many years to come to you, so he's, he's giving us an idea that okay, maybe now is when God would get me to Rome. And in his mind, he's going to go to Rome on a preaching thing. Do you remember how he went to Rome? You remember? He went to Rome as a prisoner. He got there. <laughs> but it wasn't how he thought he would get there. And I'm saying to you, God may plant a desire in your heart and you go, yeah, I'm going to head this direction. And you're thinking, it's just a nice van trip. And he goes, no, I, I'm going to have, and there might be a shipwreck and you'll get bit by a snake. And, and, oh, but you're getting there. But it's not the way I thought, envisioned it. I know, how many of you, honestly, with your lives, you envisioned you'd be here in this way Uh, seriously this is this is a godly person and i look around this room there's some godly people in the house how'd you get here it's humbling sometimes you ever look do you honestly are there ever times you just look around and go how did i get this god thank you Look at verse 24. I hope to see you. There's, by the way, there's something humble in how Paul is addressing these things. He can go, I'm an apostle. I deserve things to go my way. He goes, I hope. I hope to see you in passing as I go to Spain. So, by the way, if you look at that map there, Spain isn't on there. Spain's like over here. Okay? That's Paul's thinking. I want, I want to go to the farthest. And by the way, we never see in the scriptures that he made it to Spain. But that was his heart. There may be things that God has placed on your heart. You have that desire, and it's a good thing. And he goes, I, I don't have that for you. David wanted to build the temple. It's a good thing. But I don't have that for you. I have that for your son. But I love that he's wired that way. And, and he's thinking farthest away. It, it reminds me of a story in the Old Testament that we worked through this summer. Remember that story? This guy who wanted to go to Tarshish. Remember that? God says, go to Nineveh, preach against them. And Jonah goes, I don't want to do that. Very racist. Hated them. Hated the Ninevites. And so he starts heading toward, he gets to Joppa. This must be God's will. I got the, there's a boat here. It's going to the farthest place I would need to go to get away from Nineveh. And I happen to have the money. 
must be God's will. Isn't that how we do it sometimes? They're all out. Satan provides boats. Don't think that every time you're doing something and everything's going great, it must be God. It doesn't, it's not. Is it lining up with the calling of the book? Godly counsel. And, and so Paul's got this heart, and I love the way he's thinking. He's thinking ministry throughout and to the point where he's going, I'm going to head to Spain, but I'll stop in and I'll spend some time with you guys. I, I, I'll enjoy your, once I have enjoyed your company for a while. I love that. That ministry isn't this, this was like he enjoyed meals with them. Probably laughed a lot. We got this idea that these guys walked around, I'm boring, I'm an apostle. My life is just horrible, but don't I look godly? There's so much, I feel so much joy in these kind of things. I think they had, I think they had fun. With purpose, even. And no regrets. No waking up, the, what did I, what did I say at that party? Oh, that was fun, I got smashed. Yeah. Waking up and play. Joy. Purpose. And fun. And he's thinking, I'll spend some time with you, but I even want to go farther for God. I just think it's so cool. What a way to live. It's exciting. Verse 25. At present, however, so he's got some responsibilities. He isn't just flying, you know, all over the place. At present, however, I'm going to Jerusalem, bringing aid to the saints. This, this, this offering has been worked on for a long time because there were Jewish believers in Jerusalem that were being persecuted, that were going through some really bad stuff, and he had gone around to these Gentile churches and said, hey, these people are hurting, and he's collecting this money. He's trustworthy to, to bring this money. He says, I'm going to Jerusalem, bringing aid to the saints, Verse 26, for Macedonia and Achaia have been pleased to make some contribution for the poor among the saints at Jerusalem. So these people are really struggling. But we're going we're gonna to get them some money. And that i got to do that before I see you guys and then go to Spain, which he never makes it to. And then when he goes to Rome, it's as a prisoner. That's God's ultimate will. Look at verse 27. For they were pleased to do it. He's talking about these individuals that are giving. And indeed, they owe it to them. For if the Gentiles have come to share in their spiritual blessings, they ought to be of service to them in material blessings. He's saying, the Gentiles, we owe a lot to these Jews. They, they were, they were, this is the first church. This is a group of people that have handed us the Old Testament. We're blessed. And so we want to bless them. And then verse 28. When, therefore, I have completed this and have delivered to them what I have been collected, what has been collected, I will leave for Spain by way of you. So he's making plans. Plans that ultimately we know never happen, but he's excited about this. We can dream. We can dream big. Have you ever had something that you wanted to happen and didn't happen? It does happen. That thing wasn't bad. It's just not maybe what God wanted. Verse 29. I know that when I come to you, I will come in the fullness of the blessing of Christ. Oh, I want to be able to say that. Verse, uh, point number five as we're wrapping up. The blessings of accomplishing church growth. Verse 30. I appeal to you, brothers, by our Lord Jesus Christ and by the love of the Spirit, listen to this section here, to strive together with me in your prayers. Now get a hold of that verse. For, let's look at that again. To strive together with me in your prayers to God on my behalf. Does that, doesn't that sound hard? You see how prayer isn't just flippant. Prayer isn't just, ah, I just said it. 
or it's, it's rote, it's the same thing every time at the dinner table. That can happen, by the way. It's easy. I know people that are proud of the fact that they don't ever use written prayers, but if I were to spend a lot of time with them, they might as well write it down because they say the same thing every time anyways. We all do it. But what I see here is work. If prayer wasn't work, we'd do it more. Prayer is work. True prayer is work. We get so distracted. You ever get one, I want to pray, and you look at that, I think it was C.S. Lewis said, and you look up and that curtain shade is off. I got to straighten that. It's just how it is. The distractions. I'm so blessed by those of you that pray for all of us. We're humbled by it. Let's be prayers. If you're not, pray, you're not at prayer meeting, I hope you're praying. If you're not at grace group, and you're pray, I, I hope you're praying. And you're praying for people that need prayer. I don't know, the, I can look around the room at all the old ones with me. I'm old. I'm with you. Okay, gray, bald, gray. All right. Isn't it interesting, the older you get, the more prayer takes on a whole new sweetness? You're like, man, I need it. I need it. My mom died August of 2020, and my mom liked to pray. I mean, it's like, pray, 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 pray got to the point, I'm telling you, growing up with my mom, you'd want to leave. Well, let's pray. Oh, I just want to go out and play. I'm serious. She would find reasons to bring me into the house, you know, and some of you are like, that's glorious. I can play video games. There were no video games. Outside was like the thing. And she had heard about Don Kessinger, who played for the Chicago Cubs, and he was going to give his testimony on Moody Radio. It was why did they pick the middle of the most active playing time? Mark, I want you to come in and sit and listen to Don Kessinger, shortstop for the Chicago Cubs, and his testimony. I'm sitting there, it's killing me. I don't remember a word he said, but I do remember that she valued that. And that when I'd leave every morning for school, we're praying, and then she'd say these words. And remember who you belong to. I'm saying to each and every one of you, remember who you belong to. I'm going to curse you like she did me. It took away a lot of fun, all right? Remember who you, and it became something dearer to me as I got older. Because if, if you're a Christian, if you're saved, God is your dad. You have his name tied to you. And so you're on mission. You're on calling for him. That's the beauty. Here's the beauty of it. I'm not calling you to Grace Bible Church. I'm not calling you to me and following me. Here's what I'm doing. Pointing you to him. What better way to live? I think we got a great thing going here. But it isn't my thing. I want it to be his thing. We, the leadership of this church wants it to be his thing. Let's keep going. Strive together with me in prayers to God on my behalf that I may be delivered from the unbelievers in Judea. So when I go and I'm speaking to a group of people, whether it be in McDonald's or in the public school or in a situation where they're unbelievers, I want people praying for me. I want to be used of God. I don't want anything standing in the way. These are, these are lost people. The Bible calls them dead. Without Christ, we're dead. So he says, I want you to pray that I may be delivered from them and that my service for Jerusalem may be acceptable to the saints. Pray for your interaction with believers too. We're praying. Here's the point. We're praying about everything. So that, back to that verse, so that by God's will, I'm, I'm humble enough to go, I, I want God's will. It might not be what I think. I'm, I'm thinking I'm going to Spain, and he's going, oh. I'm thinking I'm going to Rome on a nice trip, and he's going, no, I'm going to do it differently. I'll get you to Rome. 
so that by God's will I may come to you, Rome, with joy and be refreshed in your company. Boy, now we look at it and he's like, oh, but he was, he was obedient. What better way to be? And then, as, as this has already been read to us, verse 33, may the God of peace be with you all. That's what I want for you. I want peace. I want your, let not your heart be troubled. And then he says, amen, so be it. What are you carrying today? Are you carrying anxieties? Are there cares that are just weighing on you? God wants you to be peaceful. I, want to, I hope I, as I hand you the assignment I hand to you, I hope I don't hand to you, oh, you're giving me more. No, I'm, his burdens are light. He takes them. And I hand this to you because I know you'll be happier. Instead of holding on to all of your stuff and going, this is what makes me happy. Does it make you happy? Why do you keep needing more of that? That rivalry or some people bitterness. Some people are holding on to some stuff, man. It's easy to do. And they'd almost be lost. Man, if you took that away, I don't know what I'd think about. I like being angry at that person. It kind of gives me a reason to wake up in the morning. What a horrible way to live. But you've met that person. Mumbling in the corner. You don't want that. You want, delight yourself also in the Lord, and he will give you the desires of your heart. You'll, you'll be shocked at what I, I got to do, how I'm wired. But with purpose. Not just for my personal entertainment, but for his glory and my good. What a way to live much better way to live. Let's pray. Father, thank